Good evening. Welcome to our worship service on this Monday, Thursday evening. You know, Monday, that's sort of a funny word, isn't it? Strange word. Uh, it perhaps comes from, and there's a little bit of argument about where it does come from, from the Latin word mandatum, uh, which means a mandate. And Jesus said on this night, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And if I stop right there, you'd have to say, that's not new. We're always supposed to love one another. That's what the Ten Commandments says. But then he goes on. He says, as I have loved you. And then the Bible says, and he went on to show them the full extent of his love. What does that include? Included foot washing. It included the very thing that we'll concentrate on tonight, the Lord's Supper. That change, that fulfillment, really, or looking forward to the complete fulfillment of the Passover. Jesus on the cross and to the empty tomb. And so this night is that really big, not beginning to Holy Week, but now those things really become huge events for us. What a, a blessing to be able to gather to worship tonight and to receive the Lord's Supper. God's blessings on your worship. Let's begin with hymn 135, verses 1 to 5. You'll find the order of service in your bulletin for tonight. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I will tell you that all the readings that we have for tonight go together very neatly. This is the only one I'm not preaching on. 
um, because with the sermon text that you have uh, noted in the bulletin that way, I'm drawing in everything else that you see there. Uh, originally, when this sermon was put together, it had five texts, and I thought that'd take a long time to read. And uh, so I wanted you to see all of that, but I also want you to hear some Old Testament roots. This comes from the book of Jeremiah, where God says, when I set up that covenant with you, if you do what I say and have no other gods, I will be your God, and you will be my people, you get the land and everything else. He said, you broke that. But he doesn't say, and so we're never going to have any kind of neighborly relations again. He says, I have a new covenant in mind, one that I'll establish myself. From Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31. Yes, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant of mine, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his, his neighbor, or each one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their guilt, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of God. Let's continue then with hymn 135, verses 6 to 9. Just a, a quick word is that 1 Corinthians was written about 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. And notice what Paul says there by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This is the New Testament, or New Covenant, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks in an unworthy way because he does not recognize the Lord's body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is the word of our Lord. The choir will sing.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the gospel according to Mark tonight, starting at verse 17. When it was evening, he arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me in the dish. Indeed, the Son of Man is going to go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. They all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many. Amen, I tell you, I will certainly not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of our Lord. Having heard the gospel, let's confess our Christian faith together using that summary of our faith that we find in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate to the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. Acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let's continue with hymn 315, verses 1 to 4.
Testament from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text, or at least one of them that we have for tonight for our meditation, comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 20. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. As they were eating bread, he said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He replied, The one who dipped his hand in the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man is going just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who betrayed him, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. He said to him, Yes, you are the one. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. He said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, or the New Covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, we have heard your word. In fact, we've heard two of your gospel writers tell us this word and give us a few more details. Now, Lord, as we meditate on the words that you have given us, first of all, Lord, set a guard over my mouth that I speak only the truth. And then open our our hearts and our ears. Lord, let us be attentive. Let us believe the things that you tell us. Lord, increase our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of our amazing Savior, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it was quite a Thursday night, wasn't it? It starts with that awful, awful statement, one of you will betray me. And it makes me wonder, as you go around the table and each of the disciples says, and they say, is it I? And they're really expecting a no answer the way the Greek question is asked. But it makes you wonder, makes me wonder, why did they ask? Had they been with Jesus long enough to realize, I might say I'd never do it, but it doesn't always work out that way. Certainly not going to work out that way for Peter that night, nor the rest of them who said they'd never fall away. Is it I, Lord? Could I do this without even trying, Lord? Could I mess up this badly? And then finally... Jesus has to say to Judas, remember how Nathan talked to David when he said, thou art the man. And Jesus says to Judas, it is you. The one thing we don't get in these two gospels is what happens next. Because Jesus says to Judas, what you do, go do quickly. And Judas went out into the night. The disciples all thought he'd gone out to buy something for the poor, give something to the poor, which was very common during the Passover feast. So maybe that's what he was up to. Had they not heard what happened at the table? There isn't really an answer for that. But now that they're ready, all the foot washing has taken place before this. Now that they're ready, Jesus interrupts the Passover meal and does something that they would never expect. The bread and the meat have been removed. The third cup is on the table. It's time for the story of the Passover, the giving of thanks for what God did for them. There will be a fourth cup with a final hymn and they'll go out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus puts bread back on the table. And the wine is already there. Tonight, one of the biggest things that we're talking about, especially on this Maundy Thursday, we call the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Well, you know, if I ask you what communion means, you would get an idea of it. I found a really interesting definition. Communion is sort of a contraction of the words common union. Something we have in common that is put into union with one another. And I will tell you there are three common unions in communion. Kind of sounds like a stutter. There are three communions in the Lord's Supper And it is my prayer that the Lord will show us those tonight in this text. You know, if you're invited to a a dinner party and your host sets the food down in front of you, it doesn't take too long before you figure out, unless you're eating something you've never seen, what it is that's there. If you pick up this orange thing that's sort of round 
and uh, you're looking, and it smells like an orange, and you open it up and it tastes like an orange, yeah, it's probably an orange. But what if a main dish is meatloaf? I've seen at least five different recipes for meatloaf just that have come to potlucks. I love them all. You can't make a bad meatloaf. But what's in it? I know there's meat. Got that. But I don't know beyond that. Did you put an egg in? Did you put some breadcrumbs? Did you put some sort of spice? Did you use some sort of you know, jalapeno? Now, we are in Texas, after all. Once in a while, we do infuse it with cheese. We do all those things. But most of the time, you would have to have amazing taste buds to figure out everything that is in there. And what you'd really have to do, if you want to know everything that goes into that, you'd have to ask the host what's in it. You know, it's easy to look at the Lord's Supper and figure out what's there. It's bread and wine. It's exactly what Jesus said it is. And if we said, no, it's not, well, then taste it, look at it, smell it. Because to deny that it is bread and wine would, would be deny, to deny our senses and to deny God's clear word where it says Jesus took bread and wine. The word in Greek is oinus. It means real wine, real fermented grape juice. There are some that say it was in the springtime, so there hadn't been time enough yet for it to ferment, so it was unfermented wine or grape juice. The problem, that can be true. The problem with that theory is the Jews never used unfermented grape juice at the Passover. It was wine or nothing. And they gave wine to their little kids. They heavily diluted it, but it was given as wine as long as they could take food and drink by mouth. And so, no, we're talking about real wine and real real bread. But don't let your eyes fool you, because there's something there that your senses can't tell you anything about. Something that the bread and wine is joined to, that it has a common union with. Because Jesus, our host, says to us, this is my body. This is my blood. Now, I've had people ask me, well, pastor, doesn't doesn't that really mean that Jesus is talking figuratively? He couldn't possibly give him his body and his blood. And so, isn't he using sort of a, a figure of speech? Well, I would say that's possible if it were I who were saying those words. If you sat at my table and I gave you a piece of bread and said, this is my body, and I wasn't laughing or you didn't think I was off my rocker, You might think, you would have to believe I was speaking figuratively. You can see my body, it's right there. And there's no way that I can be in more than one place at one time. Jesus can. Jesus is. Jesus said, I am with y'all. And it's plural in in Matthew. I'm with y'all, always, even to the end of the age. And so our Lord can be, when he says, this is my body, he means he's there. And if it's Jesus who says it, not me. This is not my words originally. This is our Lord's word. So if our Lord, who is God the Son, says, this is my body, it's what it is. Also note that the Bible refers to this as the New Testament. And remember, a couple times I said, or covenant. It's a word I'm a little more familiar with. Testament, sometimes we think of this, this little portion uh, of the Bible that has those 27 short books in the back of it there. It's not what that originally meant. A testament. Think of the word last will and testament. Now you're closer. A covenant. A covenant is a legally binding agreement. It's like a legal contract. And in those days when you made, from the days of Moses to the days of Jesus, if you made a covenant with someone and it is written down, you had to use very precise language. You needed it so nobody could misunderstood what the terms of this contract are. Jesus, as God the Son, knew that all this would be written down and that it would be remembered. And if Jesus meant for us to remember that this is a way that we simply remember his body and blood given for us at the cross, we do that, but that's not all that we do in Holy Communion, then he would have said something like, well, this is how you'll remember it. Or this represents my body and blood. This will make you think of it. The the wine is red. It kind of reminds you of blood. The bread might remind you of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life or his body given for you. Jesus would say it's all symbolic. But that's not what he said, was it? Our Lord used very, very simple first grade Greek words. The first verb anybody learns, esten, is. When he said, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. 
And you heard me say as they introduced 1 Corinthians 11 tonight, 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, we see that the New Testament church in those very early days, they truly believed that along with that bread and wine and communion, they got Jesus' real body and blood. When under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God caused the Apostle Paul to write to the Corinthians, he said, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks in an unworthy way because he does not recognize the Lord's body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. God's Word says that when we eat and drink, we need to recognize that Jesus' true body and true blood are here. And if we don't, if we refuse to believe that, God's Word says that we're sinning not against bread and wine, but against the body and blood of our Lord that are in union with that bread and wine. Martin Luther said it so beautifully. He said, if a hundred thousand devils should rush forward and ask the question, how can bread and wine also be the body and blood of Christ? We know that all the demons together with all the scholars in the world do not have as much wisdom as God has in his little finger. God said it, we believe it. Yeah, the words of Christ, they are absolutely clear and they stand forever. This is my body, this is my blood. That's the first of those three communions, that union of bread and wine with Christ's body and blood as our Lord promised us. Now, there are different levels of friendship, aren't there? There's that kind of friend you had back in grade school, or maybe you went to high school with them, and you exchange Christmas cards once a year, and maybe you call each other up if there's been some big event, your old coach passed on, and you needed to share that information. And maybe when you do that, that friend says, you know, I go through DFW every now and then. I really ought to stop in. I'll stop for a weekend sometime and see you. And you say, oh, that sounds nice. But inside you might really be thinking, uh, I don't know. You know, <laughs> a Christmas card sort of fine. A call once in a while, once in a blue wound, but let him in my house for a whole weekend. I'm not sure I want to go there. Or do you have that neighbor that you talk to over the fence or at the mailbox? And you got talking to him over the years. I, I've known this one, I've got to point the right direction here, where are we? Across the street over here for 13 years, and we're barely on a name basis. Why is that? We're very friendly with each other. We talk about all kinds of things. They never invited me to their house, and I never invited them to mine. And it may never happen. Why? That's a more intimate level of friendship, and we know we're not at that level at least yet, in that. And then, of course, there is that level of relationship where you know there's a person you are never going to invite to a meal at your house. You don't like them. Or maybe they're the kind of person that you have to keep your eye on. I mean, they do horrible things to your... Their trash is in your yard, and their dog is chasing your cat. And when they throw some huge party to four in the morning... They requisition your patio furniture without telling you, and it's at their place. That's the kind of person that's not going to sit at your table and you're going to serve them a four-course meal. To even think about it is just laughable. But uh, don't misunderstand. This is your relationship with God. Mine too. Mine too. Yep. You see, we have... We have done such awful things to God. We have misappropriated all the wonderful blessings that He's given to us. Why would He ever invite us? At times we have refused to keep His commands. Yeah, I've done the little kid thing and put my foot down and said, don't want to. And we have often, well, in a way, sort of given God a rude gesture when He just wants to come near us. It wouldn't be surprised to me if God were our next door neighbor. If He saw us coming down the street, He'd duck inside not really want to talk to us. Or how about if he built a great big fence between us so we could never set foot on his property? And in a sense, that one's true. But it is we who built the fence. Your sins have separated you from God so that he will not hear you, says Isaiah 59, verse 2, is how badly we have treated our God. Huh. You know, we shouldn't ever even be able to think about setting foot on his property. It should be that if we thought we were ever going to get an invitation to God's house, oh yeah, right. Yeah, don't camp out at your mailbox waiting for that one. 
Because what does the scripture tell us? Colossians 1 says, <clears throat> At one time you were alienated from God and hostile in your thinking as expressed through your evil deeds. So when God plans that special meal, don't plan on an invitation. Really? Really? But that's exactly what he does. Gives us an invitation. He comes to you. He comes to me and he knows me very well and he knows you very well and says, take and eat. This is my body. You take and drink. This is my blood given and shed for you. Why would God give us such a gracious invitation? Why would God even stop to talk to us, let alone invite us to his supper? You know, we can find the answer in the supper itself. Because here are Christ's body and blood in, with, and under, joined to the bread and wine. That not only do we see that communion, God's word says, that's also how we are joined to God. 1 Corinthians again, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, Colossians 1 again, says this. But now Christ reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you holy, blameless, and faultless before him. So if God invites you into his house, is he worried that you might track mud in his house? I don't know if I want him. Or you're going to spill something on the tablecloth? I've never thrown my grandchildren out for that. Hopefully, I, I don't remember throwing my children out for that. If I have, they can text me and I will tell you I'm sorry. But the, that is not how, how God looks at this at all. No, it says right here, Christ reconciled you in his body of flesh through death. Reconciled? Brought us into God's family. Says, you are now my family. So that he has made us holy, blameless, and faultless before him. You know, that's exactly what Jesus said when he instituted Holy Communion. He said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood of the New Testament or covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What beautiful, beautiful words. They assure you and me that not only is God interested in living with us, no offenses, he wants us at his table. He wants us to have a meal with him. Tonight, we've really focused on the word communion when we talk about these communions, the one between bread and wine, and now this communion between us and God. But it's, I think, especially that that helps us to see how precious to us the Lord's Supper is. It's the Lord's Supper. It's his house. It's his bread, his wine. It is his body. It is his blood. And yet he has given you an invitation and he's given you the VIP invitation. He says, I want you at my table. I'm inviting you personally. Yeah. You know, this wonderful thing that we call Holy Communion. It is perhaps that one of the three communions that we cherish most dearly in our hearts. It assures us that the body and blood comes along with the bread and wine, has made us worthy. It, Christ's body and blood with the bread and wine, has made us worthy to dine at God's table here and with him forever in eternity. You know, the thing about dinner parties, though, is... How about the guest list? You get an invitation, but you've been told you're not going to be the only one who'll be there. And you might be concerned. I'm a little bit of an introvert. You may not believe that, but I, I get a little concerned about that if I don't know who else is going to be there. Will I really connect with him? Will we have anything in common? And if I sit down next to a, to a guy and, and he is so totally into trigonometry, that's all he can talk about. My brains are falling out my ears about that point. Or if he loves to, to garden and he loves to work in the yard, well, I'll do it of necessity. And if he just can't get home to watch the shopping channel, I don't know that we're going to have a whole lot to talk about. Or if that person sitting across from me just cannot express their hatred for the Cowboys enough. Or if they talk about the competitive nature of sports drives them nuts, this is going to be an uncomfortable meal. This is really going to be tough. But if I find one thing that we have in common, suddenly we have a unity. 
Suddenly we have something to talk about. And all those other things that just kind of fly away. They're not all that important in the long run. What's more important is this thing we have in common. Think how different the disciples were. You had fishermen working with their hands. You had a tax collector, a bean counter. And that's about as different as you can get. You had Simon the Zealot who was willing to pick up a sword and die in order to get his country back. And you had some that were sort of milk toasts and, and doubters amongst them. You had the very ambitious like James and John. And you had some very laid back that we don't hear a whole bunch about in the disciples. And yet they form one group in quite a bond. What bound them together? What did they have in common? One word. One name. Confirmation answer? Thank you. I heard it. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus. That's what they had in common. And that's what binds us together too. There's a lot of differences in this congregation. Men and women, boys and girls, that makes us different. The kind of work we do. Sometimes I don't even understand the kind of work you do. Uh, because it's, we, uh, I, I agree with Phil Robertson, I'm a low-tech man living in a high-tech world. And some of those things just go whoosh right on by me on, on those kind of things. And there are other things. We may not be of the same political leanings. We may not believe the same thing about how things ought to work in the world. And the devil says, I want to use that. I want to get it so that when you know those things, you won't kneel down next to each other because you'll see those kind of differences and make them the important thing. Oh no, when we come here tonight to this altar, we stand united. Because we're standing there next to a Christian, to a Lutheran who believes the very same things that we do. That the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God and the supreme authority in everything that we teach and believe. We have said that the doctrines that we have learned here from God's Word as expressed in Luther's small catechisms are right. And we will stand by them and we will confess them as the truth. And it's awesome to do that with other people and to know that these truths we hold together. To know that we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one loaf. What a beautiful fellowship we have in communion. Tonight, as we stand next together, we next to each other, we may stand next to someone with whom we've disagreed in a voters meeting or with whom we've disagreed about all kinds of things and yet we are united in Christ. And we are confessing along with God's word from Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith and one baptism that unites us. You know, we express this unity, unity as we did a moment ago as we said the creed together. We said, these are the things we believe. It touches our emotions when we sing hymns together. How I love to do that. Another expression of this wonderful unity. And it is a unity that I think we see most clearly, perhaps feel most clearly, as we kneel or stand together shoulder to shoulder at this altar and receive the Lord's body and blood. In just a few minutes now, we will receive Holy Communion. And as we do, may we recognize those three communions. That communion of bread and wine with Christ's body and blood made so because of Christ's promise, not because of anything that I do. That communion between God and us being reconciled by the body and blood of Christ. And that communion that we enjoyed to, together as one body united in faith. God's blessings on your communion. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> and now the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Tonight we have a special prayer request. Some of you know Laura Hartwig, and if you haven't heard this news yet, her son Lee was uh, unfortunately called home to heaven through a kayaking accident. And so it's a tough thing on this family and tough for a mom to have to go through this uh, with her child. And besides the fact that Lee was married, and I think I heard had two daughters. Daughters? Yeah. And so we pray for those children left behind for that wife and, and for Laura as well in our prayers. Let's pray. Our Savior Jesus Christ, God provided us with a Passover lamb to save us from eternal death when he sent you into our world and sacrificed you on the cross for our sins. O oh, work true repentance in our hearts.
causing us to make sincere confession of our sins and to believe with joyful trust that he has forgiven us for your sake. May your body and blood given and shed for our sins and imparted to us here this evening in bread and wine in that supper which commemorates your death ever nourish our faith, cheer our hearts, and strengthen our will to live godly and upright lives. Gracious Lord, drive out all hypocrisy from our hearts and grant to each one a heart truly set upon you and lips that make bold and honest declaration of your name to others. Do not allow Satan to rob us of the treasures of heaven by tempting us to love the treasures and pleasures of this world. As you went resolutely forth to meet the enemy, intent on doing the Father's will, so may we be set to obey him in everything, so that what pleases him pleases us. By your Spirit, help us to watch and pray at all times, and to be fully aware of the weakness of our flesh. And if the time of victory over our sinful flesh and the wicked world seems long in coming, and the evil on every hand depresses us, teach us to find joy and courage through believing your promises of everlasting salvation. And Lord, in that light, we ask you to be with Laura Hartwig and Lee's wife and his children, to bless them, Lord, with the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, that to believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Lord, that you will not abandon them, that you know their very needs, and you have said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Lord, make their hold on your promises even stronger in these sad days. Precious Redeemer, may your face that once reflected the burden of our sins and the anguish of hell always be turned toward us in love and tenderness. Let no one in this Christian assembly who has known you as friend and Lord as well as Savior ever betray your love. And may the dear blood once shed for us be for our sins for the, for the perfect cleansing power. Hear us to the glory of your name, O Holy Redeemer. Amen. Amen. We pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Some of you may have seen these questions. Some may have seen these questions in the back part of the hymnal, I think around page 156. I brought them forward tonight so that we can use them together as we prepare for Holy Communion. I invite you to read that which is in bold type. It is fitting on this night that we prepare ourselves for receiving the supper our Lord has prepared for us. Proper preparation for the supper includes an examination of our hearts. Therefore, let us ask the following questions and take to heart their answer. What does God tell me about myself in his holy word? He says that I am a sinner and deserve only his punishment. What should I do if I am not aware of my sins or am not troubled by them? I should examine myself according to the Ten Commandments and ask how well I have carried about, out my responsibilities as a husband or wife or single person, as a parent or child, an employer or employee, a teacher or student? Have I loved God with all my heart, gladly heard his word, and patiently endured affliction? Have I been disobedient, proud, or unforgiving? Have I been selfish, lazy, envious, or quarrelsome? Have I lied or deceived, taken something not mine, or given anyone a bad name? Have I abused my body or permitted indecent thoughts to linger in my mind? 
Have I failed to do what is right and good? When I realize that I have sinned against God and deserve his punishment, what should I do? I will confess before God all my sins, those which I remember as, those, as well as those of which I am unaware. I will pray to God for his mercy and forgiveness. How do I receive his gracious forgiveness? His word assures me that Jesus led a pure and holy life for me and died on the cross to pay for, uh, for me to pay the full price for all my sins. Through faith in Jesus, I have been clothed in my Savior's perfect righteousness and holiness. What further assurance do I have that Jesus is mine and I am his? In Holy Communion, he gives me his body and blood together with the bread and wine as a truly life-giving food and drink to unite me with him and my fellow believers. By means of this sacrament, Jesus not only forgives my sins, but sweeps away all my doubts about his love for me, gives me his own strength to live a God-pleasing life, and grants me a joyful foretaste of heaven. How can I be sure that I receive all these blessings in the Lord's Supper. I have his own word, spoken as his last will and testament on the night before he died. There he tells me, take and eat. This is my body. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. How will I respond to this priceless gift of Jesus? I will daily thank and praise him for his love to me. With his help, I will fight temptation, do my best to correct whatever wrongs I have done, and serve him <clears throat> and those around me with love and good works. We join in prayer. Lord Jesus, with joy and gratitude, I now come to your table to receive the precious food of your life-giving body and blood. May it strengthen me to remain in you as you remain in me, so that I bear much fruit in devoted service to you and in acts of kindness to others. Amen. Please be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped and he gave it to them saying, Drink from it all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Some of you have asked, when will the common cup return? The answer is tonight. And so if you would like the common cup at communion, uh, the, the tray of cups will pass through first, and I'll come through right behind that. So if you'd like the common cup, cup just wait for that, and we'll commune you then. I'm looking out and know everyone here tonight, so I can simply say what a joy. We are in fellowship with each other. Let's enjoy communing with one another. And we'll commune the elders and then others.
Please rise for prayer. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's remain standing for hymn 316. Please be seated. What a joy to gather on this night and to celebrate Holy Communion. Tomorrow night, uh, service begins at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're having our Good Friday service then. And uh, there, there are some who said, do we have to do Tenebrae again? Well, yeah. <laughs> He's actually taking the blame on himself. But the, uh, the answer is, yeah, we're going we're gonna to end in darkness tomorrow and start in darkness on Easter morning. Um, and the choir, actually, the choir actually will finish the service tomorrow. So it'll be kind of neat how uh, we've, been, we've been blessed with, with such a wonderful choir and great musicians and good music to do. So I'm really looking forward to that service as well. There we'll be talking about the seven words from the cross and listening to Jesus as he pays for the sins of the world. Um, also then on Easter morning, uh, sunrise service is at 7 o'clock, breakfast at 8 Late service begins at 10.30. We do have Sunday school and Bible class at 9 o'clock. So sort of regular schedule after sort of tacking on the early part that way. Uh, I know there's a few getting together after the service, right, Terry? Anything banned? Okay. Anything else that needs to be brought up tonight, as long as we've got some folks here? Uh, say it again. 
I have to change the... Pyramids. Pyramids. I heard thermos and I thought, I don't know anything about a thermos. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to go camping real bad, so that'll have to wait till next week. So, okay. Yeah, if we could have a couple strong folks stay around and we'll change out pyramids and get ready for Good Friday. God's blessings to you.